vision received was that of blood cells traveling throughout the body, supplying the much needed oxygen and other nutrients to the differing members of the body to fulfill their purpose. Once the blood cells are spent, they must return back to the heart to be refilled before being sent out again and fulfill their purpose. Thank you for your love. I'll take that as an act of love and appreciation. Um, you know me. I consider myself a, an honor and a privilege to be here before you, to speak among you, and to try to give you something that I've received of the Lord. Um, anything that I preach up here is not for you only. It is for me as well, and it's for anyone that is, has an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And yes, I believe that the Spirit is going to speak to us today if we will have our ears attuned to his voice. So if you all will turn into the scriptures, of course, and turn to Matthew chapter 10. We can start at verse 34 of Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is speaking. We know that because of the red letters, in case you're not aware. But it's quoted and probably says a bit before that Jesus said or Jesus answered or something. He said, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wasn't he known as the Prince of Peace? Sounds like a paradox. Sounds like a contradiction. He's the Prince of Peace, and he just said, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I came to bring a sword. So we kind of got the wrong impression of him. I don't know if you know this or if you're aware of this, but if you look at history of nations, whenever there was peace in the nation, there's something that always preceded it. Anybody know what that was usually? What? I, I didn't hear? War. War. Wow. I have a very astute congregation here. Thank you, Jesus. That is right. Peace will not come on the earth without a battle. It's not going to come without engagement. It's not going to come without a war. And so he is a warrior. And he came to destroy the works of the devil in order to bring about the peace that we all desire that we all long for, that we all groaning for deep within ourselves. He says in the next verse, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Ouch. I'm not sure who you are, Jesus, but if, that's what you're bringing about. I'm not sure I'm, I'm interested in that wagon that you're pulling right there. In Hebrews chapter 10, 31, it says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. He says in verse 37, he who loves Father or mother, more than me, is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or his daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I've spoke on this in another message years ago. You can look in the library for it. It was called the demanding love of God. We, we think of love as something like lovey-dovey and, you know, cupids around throwing arrows and you kind of just fall in love with someone and you just couldn't help yourself and everything is all cutesy and puppy love. Puppy love. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. Infatuation. Infatuation. Lust. <laughs> yeah, let me move on. Um, the demanding love of God cannot be sidestepped. If Jesus was standing on a beach 
with those verses that I just read, he just drew a line in the sand. It's him on this side of the line. He draws this line across the sand. There's nobody else behind him. There's nothing else but more beach and more water. And there's nothing there. And everybody's in front of him. And he just says, if you want to love me, you must love me more than your father, more than your mother, more than your son, more than your daughter, more than your cousin, more than your uncle, more than your aunt. I'm ad-libbing because it's about the idea. It's about the thought that if you are thinking that you are going to be able to love anyone else, even with me or greater than me, you got another thing coming. You're not worthy of me or my love. He's not standing on that line, on that beach, and he's not standing on that line so that he can come here to placate you. He's not here to appease you. He's not here to be your sugar daddy so that you can be happy with him. He looks at these temper tantrums of his children and he's not trying to placate them with candy so that they can be quiet and they can be more peaceful. He draws that line in the sand and he is saying, you will either surrender willingly or not at all. It's your choice. Now we read those red letters. We know that's in the new covenant because there's no red letters in the old covenant although he spoke all the way through there through his prophets. But it's the same idea. It is the same thought. It is the same demand that he gave to the Israelites, to his people in the old covenant. He said in Joshua 24, if it seems evil to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve in verse 15 of chapter 24. It's the same idea. It's the same thought. You're not going to be able to walk on the left side with one left foot and on the right side with one right foot and think that you're going to walk this line. You ever try to walk a fence like that? Ends up hurting yourself. Especially to the men. He says, whether you gods which your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So you have to make a decision. Who are you going to follow? Will you serve the Lord? Serve was the word that was used there. That was when Joshua was about to enter into the promised land or, or actually when he had uh, finished because this is at the end of Joshua, Joshua 24. He's about to go and he's, he's leaving a lasting message to the Israelites. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. If I go back a little bit, you see that same thought and idea expressed in Deuteronomy chapter 30. God said, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. See, that, that line in the sand has always been there. That demand that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and strength and that you put no other gods before him has been there from day one of creation. You can eat of the tree of life. You can eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but choose. Choose is your choice. I'm not here to control you, but I'm here to tell you that you will love me. The demand is that you will love me. 
You either surrender to my authority or not, but is your choice. He says in verse 38, back to, to where we were speaking in, in, in the new covenant of Matthew chapter 10. He says, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So if you love anybody else, even or more than me, you're not worthy of me or my love. And if you don't take up your cross and you don't follow me, you're also not worthy of me or my love. He says, he who finds his life, you're going to lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Not just lose your life. Lose your life for my sake. You will find it. Now that was in, in Matthew chapter 10, and there's obviously parallel passages. We talk about those often, how the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all recount similar events or the same events, and they all have their way of describing what was said or how it was said, and some of the words are not exactly the same, but a lot of the time it's just the idea. It's the interpretation that's coming about that they're giving, and so this was spoken about again in Matthew 16. It started in Matthew 10, and he basically said at the end, take your cross, follow me, or else you're not worthy of me. And then he repeats this same message at the end in Matthew 16. He, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And those are the three keys that I want to emphasize and focus on today. He says again, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it in Matthew 16, 24 and 25. If you look at the other parallel passages in Mark chapter 8, 34 through 38 and Luke chapter 9, 23 through 26, it's almost word for word. All of these recounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and so the same idea, the same impact, the same impression he was giving, he was giving to them all regarding this need that if you're going to follow after me, you must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and follow me. And so what exactly does that mean to be able to deny yourself? What in the very next verse of Matthew 16, 26, he says, what profit is a man if he gains the whole world? So now there's a contrast here. You may not understand what it means to deny yourself. So let me give you an understanding. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he ends up losing his own soul? Well, wasn't he talking about losing your life or, or holding on to the life? And, and, and whether you will uh, uh, actually keep it or you will actually find it. So he's giving an analogy. And what does it profit a man if you gain all of these material things in this world and you end up losing your own soul? Well, that's what it means to deny yourself. There's a lot of things in this world that, that, that are attracting you. And in our day and age, it's usually through the media. Music. Hollywood, social media, taking up our time, grabbing our attention, the memes, the different jokes that are out there. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bombardment because of all this techno technological advances that we made in the last 100 years. Started with the radio, then it went to TV, and now it's movies, and now it's internet and social media constantly grabbing our attention and, and diverting our attention off of what it needs to be. And so if we're going to deny ourselves, we need to realize we need to let go of some of these things that, that have our attention. 
Because what does it matter if you gain all of these riches and in the end you end up losing your own soul? That is a narrow temporal view of your life. And God wants us to take a step back, let all that stuff go and realize that our life, whether we go to hell or whether we go to heaven, is eternal. You need to think your decisions now in the here and now with that type of perspective. Because the decisions you make are going to affect your eternal outcome. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? We see it all the time. Even even within what we call the church. So many fallen quote unquote heroes in the faith. In this vile sin, this hidden sin, this closet sin. And so you realize what they're going to exchange. They wanted all that money. They wanted the people to continue to give and they continue to get rich and they continue to have the rich clothes, the fancy clothes and the nice house with the nice big pool and and the nice cars and the fancy transportations. But there's an addition that wasn't included in this particular uh, Matthew 16 that was recounted in Mark chapter 8, verse 38. And it was also said in Luke chapter 9, verse 26. So there's just one extra verse that was given, maybe because they remembered it more. We know all scripture is inspired by God. So whatever he gave to to Matthew is just as valid as it was given to Mark. It's just as valid as it was given to Luke. And Matthew and Mark, Luke, uh, uh, Mark and Luke say this in verse 38 of of Mark chapter eight. He says, after he said, for what will a man give in exchange for his soul? He puts this one verse. He says, whoever is ashamed of me, whoever is ashamed of my words in this adulterous sinful generation of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father. So when we're denying ourselves, there's this little aspect that you need to stand up for me in this life and not be ashamed of me, not be ashamed of my words. In the last several years, because of this increase of fear and this cancel culture, we talked about that last time, and and this, this idea you may lose your job for this and that and the other because of your beliefs, because of your stances. Well, that's exactly the testing that God has in your life. Are you going to shrink back? Are you going to fear? Because that was my last message. We're not here to fear. God is on our side if we stand up for him. If we speak out in truth, if we speak, if we stand in righteousness, God is going to take care of us. We can't trust in our jobs. We can't trust in our, our, our little clicks that we might have at work or, or, or where even in church we might have clicks. We can't trust in any of that. We need to stand in righteousness. We need to stand in truth and know that our God is going to surround us with a shield of favor and protection And so we don't need to worry. Because if we're ashamed now, when he does return, he's going to be ashamed of us. Now, denying yourself also has another aspect. I'm just giving you aspects, but I look at Matthew chapter 18. And Jesus is speaking again in Matthew 18, verse 8 and 9. He says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, what should you do? Cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into what? Everlasting fire. I told you everybody's going to live eternally. It's where are you going to live eternally? In torment? or in peace and joy with Jesus. And if your eyes cause you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be what? Cast into the lake of fire. So there are certain things that we may be doing in this life that could cause us to fall. Sin, iniquity, rebellion, 
Get rid of it. Deny yourself. Other apostles talked about that later on and talked about, uh, uh, you know, putting away, put off the sins of the flesh. Get rid of it. Cast it off and begin to walk in the newness of life. The newness of life and the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So that's another aspect of denying ourselves. Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 17. We live in a life, uh, we, we live in, in days that were very much like Noah's, very much like Lot. And Jesus said they were the days that the Son of Man will also find in the earth. He says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. What were they doing in verse 27? They were eating. They were drinking, they were marrying wives, and they were given in marriage. Now, none of that is a sin. Eating is not a sin. Drinking is not a sin. Marrying wives, that's not a sin. Get, or giving your daughters in marriage, that's nothing. none of that's a sin. The point he was making is that it says further, until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, we look at 2 Peter chapter 2. It says Noah was a preacher of something. Anybody remember what the next word is? He was a preacher of righteousness. So the hundred years that he was building that ark, according to Peter and his apostolic interpretation, is that he was preaching righteousness throughout the whole time. They were drinking, they were eating, they were marrying. In other words, they were living out their lives without any fear of the Lord. Until the day. And the door was shut. All this rain was all about them. And then water came up coming out the ground. Oh, boy, it's up to my knees. I don't know how to swim. It's up to my waist. Uh, I can get on this roof, but uh, it, it's still coming up. And they ended up all drowning. The sin was not that they were living out their days. Because God, it says in Genesis chapter 6, God brought about the flood on the world of the ungodly. Eating is not a sin. Drinking is not a sin. Marrying and getting married. Living life is not a sin. But when you live your life in a manner that is displeasing to the Lord, you raise up his ire. It says in Genesis chapter 6, 5, that the Lord saw the wickedness of man. It was great on the earth. And that every intent and thought of his heart was only on evil continually. It's not living life. It's living life in this way. Where you have no fear of the Lord whatsoever. He described it the same day in the days of Lot. He said, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. That's just life. We all have to live life. If you read Ecclesiastes, it may all be vanity, but God wants us to, to, to enjoy those things. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Why? Living is not a sin. Eating, drinking, and, and being merry and enjoying life. Well, none of that's a sin. Well, if you look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, it says that the sin of Sodom wasn't just, you know, sodomy. It says very specifically, look, this was the iniquity of your sister, your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride. They were living life full of pride. They were living life with fullness of food. They had an abundance of resources and they had an abundance of idleness. Lots of time on their hand. And what did they do with it? They didn't strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. In other words, it was all about themselves. It was completely and utterly selfish lives for self-gratification, for self-pleasure, not taking care of their fellow brethren who didn't have. But they had it in abundance and they had a lot of time on their hands to do something about it and they didn't do anything about it. 
And it says in verse 50, they were haughty and they committed abomination before me. You see, all of that having an abundant pride started with pride, having an abundance of resources and a lot of time on your hands caused them to then go into all of those overt sins that they saw, such as sodomy and such as the other things. They didn't take care of the fellow brethren. And so I took them away as I saw fit. God does that with his body. He tells you to do that with your own body. If your hand or your eyes or your foot is sinning, cut it off. And I'm not asking you that I won't do myself because I took them away as I saw fit. The Lord says to the prophet in Ezekiel. Now, when I go back to Luke chapter 17 and verse 30, it says, even so will it be in the day when the son of man is revealed. I don't know if y'all realize this, but the son of man is being revealed right now. Let me skip to a verse. Romans 8, 19 says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing, the manifestation of the sons of God. He is right now starting to reveal himself in his body through all the many members throughout the world. It's happening already. This revealing, this manifestation of the sons of God. So even so will it be in the day when the son of man is revealed in his people. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house. Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. This process that the Lord is working out in you, in me, in the rest of the body of Christ. He's saying that is, is happening right now. And as it happens, if you're the type of person that's on the housetop and you're realizing that it's happening, don't turn back to grab the things in your house. It's not important at all compared to what the Lord is trying to do through you. What's the next verse? Remember Lot's wife. Why did she turn back? She was being rescued. She was being saved. Not just her, but her husband, her two young daughters. And what did she do? She turned back because she wanted something back there as if it was more important than being saved from the judgment and the wrath to come. Deny yourself. Be ready and be willing to let go. Let it go. What we're fighting for, Ecclesiastes, is all vanity. That should not be the purpose of your life to get rich, to have this, to have that, to have this friend, to have that friend. That should not be your purpose. If you love it more than me, you are not worthy of me. And if you seek to save your own life, you're going to end up losing it. You seek to save the things that you have in your possessions, you're going to end up losing it. But if you lose your life, if you're willing to let it go, then you will preserve it. So I read these scriptures and it makes a distinct impression upon me. And I hope it does with you that we have to develop an attitude and a willingness to lose or let go of our own life. And everything that that life in this world entails in order to have true life. Because this life that we call life is not true life. And as I, I don't know if it happens to you, but sometimes I'm into the scriptures and sometimes the Lord will bring about a memory of something. It could be a song. It could be a, a movie, a TV show, something that I saw way in the past. Well, he brought this to my mind. He brought a movie that came out in 1995. Very two, very notable, notable actors. 
I don't know if you all know the movie, but I'm going to quote what he said, and, and it, it ties into exactly what I, I believe the Lord was trying to share with me and he was share, sharing with us. They're, they're sitting in a diner, and, and they're, one, one of them's a cop, the other's a criminal. And the one is going after him, but they're having a sit-down conversation first. And two very notable actors, and one of the notable actors says, you know what God once told me? Don't let yourself get attached to anything that you are not willing to walk out on in 30 seconds flat if you feel the heat around the corner. Why, why would I tie that to this? Because there's nothing in this life that you shouldn't be willing to let go for his love. At the snap of a finger, at the drop of a dime, at the heat of the corner, I, I, I'm... I'm it's not worth it. The love of my Lord for me is not worth anything that I do in this life. And we need to be willing to let it go, to lose it, as he said. We live a life that is a process of letting go the things that we have. It's part and parcel. I've been here many years, preaching many years. You guys know my, my testimony of many things that I left in my youth. Songs that I listened to, the 10,000 comics that I was reading and spending good hundreds of dollars per weekend every single week. I let all that go. And there was a lot more that I could say that I let go. But I look back on the 20 some odd years that I've actually been walking with the Lord with the spirit. And I see that I have just constantly let things go, let things go. Have I continued fighting for things and, 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 and wanting things? Yes, but... My education, you know, becoming a teacher and going for a master's degree. But there were so many things I let go and I continue to let go. And, and the degree that I got, it doesn't mean is it what, what, what it once did when I was going in college. Uh, we have to have this idea. What we have is we, we, we need to make sure that we're willing to let it go in order to obtain something greater, something bigger, something beyond our imagination that we can't see and that we can't touch. It can only be obtained by faith. So by losing the life that I now have for the promise of something greater that's found on the other side, because this life is a small portion of my eternal life. So in this section of denying yourself, I, I just leave you with the scripture because this is what the Lord shared with us. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, set your affections on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Be willing to let go. Now, the second thing was take up your cross. And when I read that and was meditating on it, what came to my mind was Romans 12.1. Y'all know to Romans 12.1? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And I highlight those two sections. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's your reasonable service. That's the cross that you bear every day. It is your reasonable sacrifice. We live morning, noon, night, when we sleep, we are living. In everything we do, whether we work, we're living, whether we're home, we're living, whether we're out in the park, we're living. All that time, our lives should be a living sacrifice in service. I thought about John. John doesn't like to be on call. No nurse likes to be on call because you want to go out and do something on the weekend with your family. You want to got a plan here, but man, if you get a call, that's it. You got to throw it all out. You got to go into work and you got to do your job, right? 
I thought of that negatively. And for some reason, the Lord said, yeah, but you're always on call with me. We are always on call with God. Every day, all throughout the day, we're on call because that's our service. It's the only reasonable service based upon everything that he's done for us to redeem us, to, to save us, to rescue us. That's the only reasonable thing is that we live out our lives on call like a servant. You know, you look in the Old Testament and, and, and they describe these servants and, and they're nothing like slaves. They're more like employers. They really are. They, they, they were taken care of. They were given a place to eat. They were given a, a, a certain place, maybe on their fields to live on for food. But when they were called, boom, they were right in the, yes, sir. What do you need done? Okay, wash the dish. Okay, okay, okay. But see, they, they had all that. And then a lot of times they were let, you know, go enjoy your, your time with your family, you know, go back home and blah, blah, blah. But if he needed to be called, bam, go call my servant. Bam, he's back. He's back. And that's the way it was. It wasn't a slave mentality. Like, whoosh, you know, get over here. No, it was more like, I'm taking care of you. This is your, this is, this is our deal. I'm going to take care of you, but you need to serve. You know, if it's taking care of my, my sheep or going out in the fields and cutting the grass or, or whatever, that's what that's what our deal is like. See, the thing is, back then, if you didn't have if you didn't have wealth, if you didn't have cattle, if you didn't have land. What were you going to do? It's not like you had all of these multinational corporations with businesses all over and you had the choice to go work with who you wanted to. You had to find someone that had. And you'd be like, hey, you need any help? I got a family got a feed here. I'm willing to work for you. And so it wasn't a slave mentality, but they called them servants. And that's what they were. We're on call. Because God called us. We're on call all the time. 24-7. And it's our only reasonable service. It says in Hebrews that by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain and through which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gifts, though through it, he being dead still speaks. That reasonable service is you being the servant, hearing the voice of the Lord saying, hey, Come over here. I want you to do this. I want you to take care of that. And then you go doing it. So what is it when you hear and you do what the Lord says? What, what is that biblically called? Obedience. Obedience. You take up your cross. You are in service on call with God 24-7. And that's obedience. That's your cross. That's daily. That's not like you get a five hour gap and, and you don't, you don't, you know, you don't have to obey the Lord between five and 10 in the afternoon. Okay. No. He bought you with a price that you can never repay. It's your only reasonable service that you are on call with him 24 seven to do his bidding. And then I turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13 through 16. He says, therefore, let us go forth to him. Let's go to him. Let's go to him outside the camp. And what are we doing? Bearing his what? Reproach. Well, that, that's very familiar. That, that sounds like if you're going to be ashamed of me now, when I return, I'm going to be ashamed of you. But if you bear my reproach now, if you let them talk bad about you now and you stand forth in the truth and you stand forth in the righteousness... That's what he's calling of you. He didn't tell us. He didn't. He, he promised us an abundant life, but he didn't say that you, you're just going to have a nice, smooth path all the way through. He says you're going to be persecuted. They're going to bring you before the governors and the judges and the magistrates and the leaders. They're going to put you on trial. That's part of bearing his reproach. 
They told Peter and, and, and the disciples, don't preach in Jesus' name anymore. Don't preach about Jesus' name. Well, <laughs> do, do I continue obeying God or do I continue obeying man? You tell me what I should do. But as for me and my house, we're going to continue obeying God. And we're not going to stop preaching about Jesus. So when I go back to that last teaching on fear not, we're not going to stop saying what is true, what is right, what is pure, what is holy. Even though the world, even though the decisions of the Supreme Court are against what God says is true and right and holy. Because I'm going to bear his reproach, it says, for we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. This is, I, I'm just passing through. I am a pilgrim. I am a sojourner. This is not my home. And this was not Jesus' home. And this is not Jesus' kingdom. His kingdom is far greater than what we see here on the earth. So while I do this, while I seek to serve him, to obey him 24-7, I'm going to offer up the sacrifice of praise all along the way. Come, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. It's the fruit of our lips giving thanks all the way through. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Yes, I bear his reproach. Yes, I'm speaking of Ili. Yes, they're falsely uh, witnessing against me. But so what? I am not here to please man talked about in our Bible study this past Friday. Jesus didn't care about what man said of him. He didn't care if the hundreds of uh, people came and were shouting his name. He wasn't anything about that. He wasn't anything about being propped up by man because we know that a couple minutes later, what, 24 hours later, they want to stone him, right? That was dumb, right? Reading that scripture. Yeah, man is fickle. Unregenerate fallen man is fickle. Very. And then while I'm bearing that cross, bearing that reproach, I mean, think of Jesus. He got whipped. Oh, God, he got whipped where his the skin on his back wasn't even there. And they put on him that that long cross bar over his back. And if you've ever had a little nick, you hate it when something touches you like, oh, ow. Well, this was all over his back. His back was ripped to shreds. His muscles was seen. And he had to take on that cross and walk through the streets to where physically he couldn't even do it anymore. Well, that may get with us. We may experience that. I know some of our fathers in the faith experienced that type of, of, of bearing of burden and reproach and captivity. But they bared it. All of the 11 disciples died as martyrs. Peter died on the cross upside down. They died probably violent deaths, according to the Fox's Book of Martyrs, depending on how they died, how, how valid uh, those records are. And so we may be asked to do the same. But all along the way, in verse 16, don't, I'm not going to forget, and we should not forget. We're going to do good. We're going to share because these are the sacrifices our God is pleased with. Our third one is following him. John chapter 12, 25. He who loves his life will lose it. There he is again, speaking that now it's in John. So we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and now we brought in John. And John says, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Do you see the word that was used? Hates his life in this world. That's not a word that Mark used or Matthew or Luke did, but John certainly used it. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. That's kind of an obvious thing, right? If you follow someone, you're going to be with them wherever they are because you follow them. 
like me taking my little child's hand behind me and they're following me. Well, everywhere I go, there he is. Of course, I'm going to be with him. But that's the way it should be. The, the moment we let go of his hand and we start venturing off on our own is the moment that we put ourselves at risk. Like when a lion in Africa or a pack of lions are looking for a particular antelope or a particular animal, they're not looking at the strongest. They're not looking at those that are in the, 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 the center of the group. Who are they looking for? The ones that are out on the edge. The ones that kind of mosey on and didn't pay attention to mommy and daddy. Say, get over here. Get inside me. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. So if I follow, in order to follow, someone has to do something in front of me. In John chapter 10, he puts it this way, in verse 4 or 5, when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. See, before I follow, something has to happen before me. Well, he goes before me. And the sheep follow him. And look, listen why they follow him. Everybody see it? Is it there? For they know his voice. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Following, you have to be led. And following him, you have to hear his voice. You can't follow without knowing where to go. You have to be able to detect his voice and what he's instructing or what he's saying. He says, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of the stranger. In verse 27 of the same chapter says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So if I'm going to follow him, I've got to hear his voice. That's important today. There's thousands upon thousands of voices out there speaking to us. But there's only one voice of the Lord. And we have to hear that one voice of the Lord. Bishop, I think, a couple weeks ago, brought up this, this, uh, account in, in, in the Bible and I, I feel it needs to be repeated again because it, it's very tied to what I'm trying to share right now. There was a man of God from Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. He was sent by the Lord to the northern kingdom of Israel. And in the northern kingdom of Israel, they were doing their own worships in their own different places. They didn't come down to worship Truly, they had their own places of worship. Well, Jeroboam was up there and there was an altar and the man of God was told to speak unto the altar. This prophetic decree that I'm going to give you. So he went and he did that. He says, there's going to come a time where those that are sacrificing upon this altar are going to be sacrificed on this altar. They themselves, those false priests are going to be sacrificed upon this altar. And then the altar broke in half as a sign of the truth, of the validity of what the man of God was saying from Judah. And Jeroboam was like, arrest him! And as soon as he put out his hand, his hand withered. And then he started begging the man of God. Please, please intercede for me, intercede for me. He did. He got his hand restored. And then he offered him to come to his palace or kingdom or wherever his house was and eat and drink with him in honor of his words. And he's like, no, I will not. The Lord has told me that I will not go to anyone's house, stop anywhere, eat anything, drink anything, that I'm not even to come back the way that I came. Yeah, it's over. Settle. He goes on his way. But then there's this old prophet from Bethel who hears what took place. And he starts asking his sons, where is this man? Go, 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 go get me my, you know, whatever, whatever it is he wrote. I don't know what animal he wrote. Go get my animal so I can go find this man. 
he goes out and he finds the man. He's sitting under a tree. And he asks him all that he did. And yeah, yeah. And he's got to confirm. They say, oh, so you're the man that did it. And then he says, why don't you come to my house? Because the Lord hath told me to have you come to my house. And it says in parentheses, it's in, it's in 1 Kings 13. It says in parentheses, but he was lying. This is an old prophet. So let me tell you, those that all are in the house of God, and I'm going to assume every soul here is in the house of God, that sometimes the Lord is going to speak something to you, and you must follow it through regardless of what some other supposed man of God comes and tells you. That's scary. But it's necessary because if you're going to love him more than me, then your love is not worthy of me. I, I told our Bible study group on Friday, and it wasn't about this, but the, the point was made that, listen, my calling is not your calling. There are principles of the kingdom that apply to every single one of us. Love the Lord your God. Don't worship any other gods before me. You know, uh, do uh, uh, walk humbly, do justly, love mercy. I mean, that's for everybody. Everybody's supposed to do that. But just because I became a teacher, doesn't mean you're supposed to become a teacher. Amen. Just because I moved to Loganville, doesn't mean now everybody has to move to Loganville. Oh, no, no, the Lord spoke to me. I got to go to Loganville. So should all of you. No, he spoke that to me, not to you. And you shouldn't feel like you have to come to Loganville and do whatever it is that I'm doing just because the Lord spoke to me to do that. Everybody's got their own calling. Everybody's got their own ministry. Not everybody's an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a teacher or a deacon or a bishop or a pastor. No, not everybody's that. Some people have the gift of helps. That's what they do. Some people have the gift of hospitality. That's what they do. And their gift is not any more insignificant than my gift in the Lord, whatever that may be. So the Lord is calling you to walk this path and go do this thing and go do it in that direction. That doesn't mean you're at odds with anyone else in the body of Christ. No, you're just doing what the Lord has called you to do. And that's okay. This man, all he had to do was do what the Lord told him to do. He specifically told him what to say at the altar, speak to the altar, and go home at another way, and don't stop anywhere, and don't eat or drink anything. Very clear. And then all of a sudden, this man comes from nowhere, prophet of God, wants to invite him to his house. Hey, the Lord spoke to me too. He told me to do this for you. The man was ripped to shreds by lying. And the lion with his dead carcass right next to him stood there on his paws. Can you imagine it? Just right next to the dead carcass and everybody was walking past it. That's strange. That's really weird. It is true. So when he says follow him, I told you something has to proceed. In order to follow someone, you have to be led. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. It says in Luke 4, 1, Then Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So I read those scriptures and I think, well, wait a second. What happened to lead me not into temptation? Didn't Jesus say, lead me not into temptation when he was teaching disciples how to pray? They call it the Lord's Prayer. It should be called the Disciples' Prayer because he was teaching disciples how they should pray. And a part of it says, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from, from the evil one. Well, Jesus was led up in the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Oh, don't get me wrong. I like to point these things out, but there's definitely an answer here. It's not that the scriptures uh, 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 con con conflicting with each other. He was led into the wilderness. Okay. Now read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13 to maybe give you better context. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. 
He doesn't lead you into temptation. In other words, to be tempted to do something evil. What he does is he allows you to be tempted. He's not tempting you to do evil. He allows it. The devil is a dog on his leash. He can't do anything. He can't touch you unless God says, okay, yeah, you can have this specific aspect. You can think of Job. Yeah, you can, you can have his children. Yeah, you can have his belongings. But that's it. And then afterward, okay, yeah, now no, no, you can touch his body. God is allowing it, but the devil's the one doing it. But it says, God who is faithful will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. So even if God allows you to be tempted, it says, with the temptation, he will also make a way of escape that you can what? Bear it. You can carry it. You can handle it. Because I'm going to make a way of escape for you. It's not that I don't know what you're going to do. I know exactly what you're going to do before you even think about doing it. But I need you to know where you're at with me. And now let's read James 1 to give it even more. James 1 verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, Quote, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself attempt anyone. That's not what he does. He'll allow you to be tempted, but he ain't tempting anyone to do evil. No, it says if we read further in verse 14, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So really, was it the devil? No, it was what you wanted. He allowed the devil to tempt him, but you might have fallen. You might have been tempted. You might have been enticed. Why? Because you really wanted to. And that's where he wants you to buck up. Be strong. Be courageous. Stand against that. Use the word like, like, like Jesus did. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He's wanting you to exercise your faith in his word. Come against the temptation. Let him come how he wants. But deny yourself. Bear it. Take it. And then stand. Obey my word. Because we know what happens if we are, are enticed and we entertain it. We talked about that this, this past Friday about entertaining these thoughts and ideas in our mind. We can't do that. We need to cast them down as vain imaginations of the enemy. We need to take them captive. Because if we don't, when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brethren. I'm warning you. So I'm going to end with these three verses. Romans 8, 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians 5.18. So don't talk to me about, oh, I got to keep this law here, this seventh day here, this Sabbath here, this eating or not eating. Of No, no, no. If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Revelation 14.4. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Now, all that is a description of when it says they were not defiled with women, they're talking about the harlot women. They didn't, they didn't interact with those harlot women. They kept themselves pure. They kept themselves holy. They denied themselves the pleasures and the gratifications of life because they wanted something greater. These are the ones who do what? Follow the lamb wherever. Ever he goes. These were the ones that were redeemed among men, being first fruits to God and the Lamb. So I conclude by just repeating the four points. 
Yeah, Revelation 14, 4. Number one, we shall love him. But it's our choice. He's not going to force you. Number two, we must deny ourselves. That's repentance, guys. That's cutting it off. That's getting rid of the things in your life. Number three, take up your cross. You are to be a living sacrifice of service in obedience with praise and thanksgiving. And number four, follow him. Learn. Ask him to teach you how to be led by the Spirit. That in due time, he will reveal that we are the sons of God. Amen. Thus is the ministry of our Father's heart through us. Our utmost desire is to be in the Father's heart, to know the Father's heart, and express the Father's heart to you. If you appreciate listening to this podcast and we're blessed, pass it along to someone else by text, email, or word of mouth in the hopes that they might be positively impacted as you were. If you are interested in supporting our efforts, we would ask you to consider the following. One, pray for us. Two, leave a positive rating or review with whomever you listen to our podcast with. And three, if you desire to contribute monetarily, you can do so at paypal.me slash jbenjesus or cash app dollar sign jbenjesus or Venmo jbenjesus. That's J. B-E-N-J-E-S-U-S. God bless.